If you ask me, what's one thing that I've come to deeply understand about climate change? It's this. Climate solutions are not a monolith. There never was, never is, and never will be a silver bullet to the climate crisis. And that brings me to an important number, one I encounter a lot as a PhD candidate in climate science. 1.5 degrees Celsius of warming. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has made it clear that to substantially moderate the worst climate risks, our rise in global temperatures should stay below 1.5 degrees. We're already at 1.3 degrees, and we're feeling it from the fires in Los Angeles to flooding in North Carolina and countless other climate disasters around the world. As someone who works in quantifying uncertainty in future climate and on climate policy, I want to share three plans that have been identified for achieving the 1.5 degree C target and take a deeper look at one of them. Something you might not have heard of yet, but definitely will in the coming years. Starting at the heart of our climate strategy, Plan A, cutting greenhouse gas emissions as quickly and as aggressively as possible. This is and must remain our primary focus. While global emissions are still rising, we're seeing unprecedented advances in clean energy and stronger climate commitments, but not at the pace we need. We do have to acknowledge that cutting emissions aggressively requires us to fundamentally alter how we power our lives. And what makes this even more complicated is that the major greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, stays in the atmosphere for centuries. This brings us to Plan B, a strategy called carbon dioxide removal, which is literally removing that excess carbon dioxide. The strategies include regrowing forests, improving soil management, and building machines that can directly capture carbon dioxide from the air. We're seeing incredible momentum in carbon removal. More research, more investments, more new technologies being built. These advances are encouraging, especially in direct air capture technologies. And although they're still in early stages, the hope is that with continued research and investment, carbon removal will become both scalable and economically viable. Ultimately, cutting emissions and removing carbon will help us stay below 1.5 degrees in the long run. But at our current pace, we're likely to exceed 1.5 degrees while these plans take full effect. Hence, we need more time. What if there was a way to buy us some time and keep temperatures below 1.5 degrees C temporarily while plan A and plan B gain full momentum? That brings us to Plan C, Sunlight Reflection Methods. Let's start with the basics. What are Sunlight Reflection Methods? Sunlight Reflection Methods are strategies that are intended to reduce the Earth's temperature by reflecting the sunlight coming to Earth's surface. Unlike Plan A and B, they do not tackle greenhouse gas directly, but they intend instead focus on managing Earth's temperature by reducing the amount of sunlight coming to Earth's surface. While many strategies have been proposed, 
the most studied one is injecting aerosols into the stratosphere called stratospheric aerosol injection. Let us parse that. What is stratospheric aerosol injection? Well, stratosphere is a layer of atmosphere high up in the Earth's surface, isolated from any human activity and above where rain occurs. Aerosols are tiny microscopic particles suspended in the air. Imagine mist coming out of your perfume or hairspray. Put it all together, stratospheric aerosol injection means releasing tiny particles high up in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight and then reduce the amount of sunlight coming to the Earth's, at Earth's surface. Let's think so about this. Which tiny particles are we talking about here? Scientists have identified sulfate aerosols, tiny particles made of sulfur and oxygen as the most promising candidate. We have extensive knowledge about how sulfate aerosols interact with our atmosphere because of decades of research on air pollution and ozone chemistry. Now you might be wondering, if sulfate aerosols contribute to air pollution, why are we considering them? Sulfate aerosols only contribute to air pollution when released in large quantities where we live and breathe, in the lower atmosphere. The key difference here is location and amount. Stratospheric aerosol injection, or SAI, aims to release a much smaller amount high up in the atmosphere to reflect sunlight. Which brings us to the critical question, how do we know that SAI can help us cool a planet? First, nature has run this experiment for us. In 1991, Mount Pinatubo, a volcano, erupted and injected millions of tons of sulfur into the stratosphere, leading to a global cooling of 0.5 degrees for over a year. Second, multiple climate modeling studies show that carefully planned SAI can produce similar cooling effects. While there are uncertainties about how much aerosols to inject, where to inject them, and broader effects, the scientific evidence consistently shows that SAI can help cool the planet. Now that we've covered the basics and the evidence, let's think about how this would work in practice. How would we get these tiny particles up in the stratosphere? We would need special airplanes that can fly higher than commercial aircraft and can carry large amount of aerosols. Imagine giant high-flying crop dusters releasing aerosols. While these planes don't exist yet, engineers believe we could build them with today's technology. And so if we had these airplanes, how often would we need to fly them? In the stratosphere, sulfate aerosols last for about one to two years. That means that to maintain the cooling effect, we would need to continuously inject them. This is a key feature of SAI, making it temporary. If we stopped injecting aerosols, the cooling effect would gradually diminish over two years. And now for the practical question of what would all of this cost? Researchers suggest that modest scale deployments cost about one to $10 billion per year. This might sound expensive, but when you consider that in 2024 alone, United States faced $182 billion in weather and climate related damages, you quickly realize cost is not the main obstacle. So if cost is not the main obstacle, 
what are the key considerations for deploying SAI? First are the physical risks. Some examples of these include ozone loss, altered rainfall patterns, and changes in air quality. These physical risks are significant, and there is substantial uncertainty about how large their impact might be. Researchers continue to study the physical risks of SAI carefully. So far, no physical risk has yet emerged that definitely rules out SAI. However, there might be other reasons to rule out SAI. One of those is governance. If setting the thermostat in your own home can spark debate, imagine doing it for the entire planet. Currently, no clear international framework exists to govern sunlight reflection methods such as SAI. And perhaps the most worrying consideration about the use of SAI is what's called moral hazard. That the mere possibility of SAI could be portrayed as a permanent solution to climate change, undermining all the progress on emissions. There's a real risk that fossil fuel interests might present SAI in a favorable light, downplay its risk, slowing down the urgency of cutting emissions. This is particularly worrisome because SAI is a ter temporary measure and does not address the root cause of climate change, which is buildup of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. As you can see, there's a lot to consider about sunlight reflection methods. At this point, I'd like to share three personal reflections from my time studying this topic. As someone who studies uncertainty for a living, my first reflection is that uncertainty doesn't automatically mean we should dismiss an idea. Larger knowns can be a reason to study something more deeply, not to ignore it. We need more research, both on the physical risk of SAI, as well as the moral and ethical dimensions of SAI. My second reflection is that sunlight reflection methods deserve a clear and nuanced spot in the broader climate conversation neither overhyped nor disregarded. We need to see them for what they are. They're not plan A or even plan B. They're plan C, and they're unique in that they're fast, cheap, and highly imperfect. My third reflection is to maintain a healthy skepticism of the messenger, and emphasis on the word healthy here. Right about now, you should be asking, what's my incentive in framing sunlight reflection methods this way? It's a fair question, because studies show that subtle differences in how you present sunlight reflection methods can shift whether people view it favorably or not. By staying alert to potential biases, mine, your, or anyone's, we can have a more honest conversation about sunlight reflection methods. So, given everything that we know about sunlight reflection methods, do I think we should deploy SAI today? Probably not not until we've done adequate research and established responsible governance frameworks. But my hope is 
that by having more conversations about Plan C, maybe we'll all realize how urgently we need to cut our emissions and remove carbon from the atmosphere. Because at the end of the day, the only way to solve a problem is to tackle it at its source. Thank you.